Welcome to the Wide World of Esports, a show devoted to all things esports. I'm your host, Catherine Noor. Today, my guests are Simon Stoats and Marcel Sina of Wolfpack Management. Our topic is the future of esports and gaming venues. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you Hello. for having us. All right. You know, I know you're, um, it's very late there in Germany and Malta. Uh, yeah. <laughs> thank you very much for staying up to be live, to appear live on uh, our show. Um, so, Simon, what is Wolfpack Management? So Wolfpack Management is a consultancy firm that specializes in, in esports. Uh, to give us uh, or to give you a little bit of uh, perspective how Wolfpack Management started, um, Marcel and I have known each other for quite a long time now. We were both um, passionate uh, gamers, you could say, but both of us um, specialize in business. Um, Marcel has uh, a lot of business experience. Uh, I have a little bit more of an esports experience as well because I played in the uni uh, university league in Germany, and uh, so I was basically the the first guy that Marcel called when he um, stumbled upon the the business idea of uh, doing a consultancy in in esports. And for what we do is we actually have a wide variety of um, of client buckets, you could say. Uh, mainly, it is about professionalizing the um, the esports industry itself, because uh, I mean, as most people th that are involved in esports, we are very passionate about esports, and uh, we think that esports is by far not where it uh, could be or should be compared to a traditional sports, for example. And the second part of the the business idea is uh, because esports is quite unique so to say um it is very uh, very hard to navigate for people from outside of the industry so we also help people companies uh, mainly from outside the industry to navigate the field marcel what is your role in the company yeah i mean we are co-founders simon and i um, i have a little bit more of an administrative role as well because um we have both entities in Estonia, which is remotely uh, administered and managed as well here in Malta. And in, in Malta, mainly I take uh, care of the day-to-day -day, um, administrative tasks and um, being uh, engaged with the government and the different entities here. Um, but overall, we are on the same page and have the same uh, level of responsibilities towards clients. And that's the important part, really. Uh, you know, I actually have been to Estonia and Frankfurt, but I haven't been to Malta. Um, you're you're more Frankfurt. than welcome to drop by anytime. <laughs> I actually did have a plan to go to Malta, but that didn't work uh, a few years ago. Um, and for the viewers, Estonia is near Russia and Finland. And um, so what is the esports um, scene like in Europe? Either one of you. Mm, well, the esports scene in Europe, <laughs> that's a good question. Esports is just such an international thing. The first uh, thing that comes to mind, of course, are the organizations and the teams. Um, so especially in, in Counter-Strike, I would say the, the esports scene was always pretty big. Um, if I have to think about unique things in esports in in Europe, I would definitely have to mention the the regional uh, esports organizations in the UK that always impressed me um, a lot by uh, just how engaged the, the fans are to their local teams. Basically, that's interesting. So, um, let me ask you, um, Marcel. Um, what what are esports like in Malta? In Malta, I mean, this country really lives from the international flair and engaging internationally. Um, the the island is quite small; half a million people live here. Uh, one interesting fact, for example, is that uh, over the course of a year, I think uh, around two point five, two point seven million tourists come. Uh, 
like unique visitors come to Malta. So that's very special. And in the summer, the, the island blows from half a million to 1.5 million. So you have one third are actual local people and then it blows up to 1.5 million. It's really important for the island to pull and attract a lot of tourists and to uh, offer a lot of entertainment and uh, leisure time activities. And therefore, esports and gaming just makes a lot of sense for Malta. And we are happy to be here. We have a big part. Uh, we are very close to the government and to some of the local esports and gaming entities. We have a big part in uh, bringing international uh, stakeholders here and also helping professionalize and grow the both the government actually and also the the teams and the esports organizations that are here. Well, you know, I have to say that Hawaii is kind of, we have some of the similar situation as Malta yes, being an definitely. island and being a tourist destination. However, we really don't have as much esports and gaming here as you probably do, but our population is probably for for Oahu, the island that I'm on, is about double that. Mm -hmm. So how long has your business been um, uh, in going on, uh, Simon? Um, that, do, that really depends on what you want to count. <laughs> so it, uh, from the start um, of us thinking about the whole project, I would say it's... Uh, roughly one and a half years not exactly but pretty much i think we started around january february um discussing the the project last year so 2020 um right when covid was about to start of course covid also heavily influenced um our the planning for our business and uh as you may have noticed with um the estonian planning and with malta uh that we are not uh, exactly set on um, a central hub uh, where we mainly act around so we are very international um, all of our team members work from home and yeah in in the the times of covid that uh, helped us out a lot that we approach the the business um, this way but uh, to come back to your question um, to actually uh, we actually formalized um, our company roughly a year ago. Uh, so it took us a little bit because we needed the the um, e-residency, it's called for Estonia, to open up the business um, roughly a year. And uh, full um, business mode. So, of course, we had, some, um, we had some stuff that we needed to do once we formalized the uh, company. But full business mode, um, including uh, working for clients, was uh, pretty much at the start of uh, 2021. Well, you know, you know, a lot of esports businesses started around uh, the beginning of the pandemic. So it's kind of interesting that you're one of them. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, the big question we have here today is, um, you know, we're, you know, we're working remotely. People are playing games remotely, uh, doing esports competitions remotely. Do infrastructure projects are they important? Um, where we're already using the internet and and re doing remote gaming and and esports. Oh yeah, I would say they are uh, vastly important. So, um, I mean, for one, if you compare it with the traditional sports, um, we already have some esports venues uh, that show, for example, the World Championships in League of Legends, in Dota, uh, Counter Strike pulls huge crowds um, of, of live viewers, not online, but uh, actually in the offline presence. Uh, that is just one piece of the, the offline cake, so to say, of the, of the infrastructures or what infrastructures can provide. Of course, tourism is a, is a big uh, point. Uh, you will see that there will be more esports and gaming venues with um, a lot of different offerings for people who, for example, can't afford the high-end computer, can't afford the sim racing equipment. Marcel will talk a little bit more in-depth about uh, all of the, the various phases that uh, 
infrastructures can take in, in regards of the offering. Um, but lastly, I would also say uh, local community. So what I experienced with, um, with eSports as a university contender for um, the University eSports League in Germany is that uh, having a localized community sharing the same hobby, sharing the same interest is a powerful, powerful thing. And of course, I've made, um, while gaming, I've made a lot of um, friends online, but having friends offline that you can actually meet that you can do public viewings uh, of, of championships together with, that's just, or just uh, go outside and have a beer together, um, meet in the nature. I mean, uh, gaming is, is still seen as, as such a nerd thing um, where people don't leave the house that often, but uh, I had a lot of uh, fun actually meeting people and uh, you know going, going out with them um, enjoying a nice dinner in a restaurant or having a drink, it's, it's a completely different experience and one that is uh, definitely underestimated in my opinion. Okay, let's shift to you, Marcel. Um, I'll let you expand on that. Yeah, so I mean, I think a lot of people have seen with the pandemic, unfortunately speaking, that uh, social contact can, can be uh, virtual, but there's a piece missing for everyone, I think, that hasn't been seeing a lot of friends or family in the last few months. And that one is the very same uh, for esports and gaming. A lot of the interactions, a lot of even if you compete, there's different things that happen when you are actually offline, uh, either with a crowd or face to face, kind of with your opponents and with your teammates. It's just a completely different ball game. And these aspects are certainly something that is super important to experience. And uh, it helps both on the, on the education side, um, be it with mentors, be it with trainers, coaches, but it also helps uh, to bond with other people. Um, some of the fair play things can actually only be really understood when you are uh, next to each other and shake hands before and after matches. This is something we see in basically all traditional sports. And um, yeah, I think in the next few decades, maybe even just a few years, we will certainly close in with uh, esports and virtual sports compared to traditional variants. You know, I think people are very anxious to get, um, to join together and play together and, um, and essentially, uh, you know, go to those venues uh, because we haven't been able to. So I think that may create more of a demand for those venues. And uh, so let's talk about projects that you're working on, uh, Marcel. Yes, so uh, we have prepared a few pictures specifically about a venue here in Malta that is being built up. Uh, I will explain picture by picture a little bit what you see, just so you can get an, uh, an impression on what kind of things are happening both in Malta, but uh, in terms of infrastructure stuff. And uh, I think what's really cool about seeing these pictures is uh, seeing it being built up in the process of creating something, um, because behind the scenes kind of stuff is very rare. And most of the time you either see uh, drafted, blueprints or you see the finished venue. So having a little bit of behind the scenes stuff, I think is super valuable. And uh, maybe it is the first time for some of you to actually see some of these things. So starting off with the first picture, this is really the gate to uh, something called Monte Cristo Estate here in Malta, right next to the airport. As I said, um, tourism will be a bit a big piece on how uh, visitors will come and experience uh, these kind of uh, events in, in Malta. So it will be, of course, locals. But as, as I mentioned before, locals uh, are very limited in, in their numbers and, of course, the youth piece as well. So we expect a lot of international uh, visitors to come. And since it's directly next to the airport, this is uh, very interesting even uh, to arrive just for a few days and really with the intent to uh, mainly spend time on, on the esports complex that is being built here. Okay, and then the, uh, what does this picture show? 
So this is actually the plaza where you arrive. Uh, there are different buildings. Uh, the esports complex is only a part similar to what you have. Um, you, you told us, of course, uh, talking a little bit prior that you were at the HyperX Arena in Las Vegas. Um, the arenas are most of the time just a small part of the overall venue. Sometimes you have hotels, restaurants, um, theaters, these kind of entertainment pieces are usually somehow connected or in the same overall uh, infrastructure. And the same, very same thing uh, here with the Maltese estate where there are a few restaurants, uh, the main one you can see here. There are even sometimes small uh, car shows out here uh, at the plaza. So people would present new cars or uh, yeah, just get together outside and uh, talk to each other. As Simon has said, gaming is, of course, a big piece of what will happen, but it's important to uh, gather outside, take a walk, and uh, just have some snacks and get together at different places around these kind of venues. Sure. And, you know, it seems like um, a lot of venues all over the world are uh, multi-use venues where they're um, you know, they have restaurants, they have gaming facilities, esports, uh, you know, facilities for music and, you know, concerts and, and other um, activities. Um, I, one, one that comes to mind is in uh, uh, London, um, I, uh, the name uh, escapes me right now, but it has everything like museums and, you know, all sorts of things. It was one of the venues for the Olympics. So then mm -hmm. let's move through your pictures. Let's look at the of game. Course. The, uh, yeah, so this is the entrance, by the way, to the specific building where the esports complex is being built. I mean, what is important to know is you either have finished buildings where you move your esports venue in, uh, and the other option is to completely build something from scratch, which is, which is currently happening, for example, in Toronto with over, I think, 4,000 seats uh, for uh, for esports entertainment. I mean, it's it's a huge venue of 30,000 square feet uh, completely. Uh, we have seen one that is actually bigger, but that's definitely one on the bigger side of things. And we are excited that actually buildings are completely dedicated and planned out just for the purpose of esports and uh, related entertainment. Sure. and. Um... Simon, can you take us inside of that venue? Oh, for sure. Um, so here on the next few pictures, you will see the sim racing uh, a little bit closer. So World Pro Racing, of course, uh, focusing uh, mainly on sim racing for now. But they also have plans to expand beyond the sim racing and into uh, other esports titles, gaming titles as well. Um, a very, very beautiful setup. Here in this picture, you can see them uh, in the process of setting up their, um, their sim racing equipment. Uh, you can see uh, a lot. There's, there's definitely a, a lot of high-tech equipment. And um, the guys put a lot of love inside this, uh, this project. Um, I'm definitely excited to see how it turns out when it's completely finished. Yeah, sure. we're excited to have you there, Catherine. <laughs> yeah, we will show I, you around. Right. Um, so, <laughs> Marcel, what what projects uh, should people keep their eyes open for? I know one thing you mentioned Toronto and another Toronto, I think yes. Shanghai, Shanghai. Yeah, so of course, Asia and I have to say the Middle East, they really put in money into these kind of infrastructure projects. Of course, we have a little bit outside knowledge uh, left and right beyond the esports and gaming world. To be honest, a lot of the esports investments uh, tied to uh, general infrastructure investments. So uh, what we see is that Asia and uh, the Middle East, they just invest huge amounts of uh, money into general infrastructure, whereas a lot of the stuff is mostly built out in, in Europe and North America. So there it's Mostly it's really maintaining and maybe um, marginal upgrading of things or installing, as I said, some of the esports capabilities into existing stuff. Um, but yeah, for example, Saudi Arabia has a complete sports city that is being built within the next three years, including a Formula One track and 
a, a football outdoor stadium and part of it will definitely be also esports and some of these hybrid games as well so uh, games where uh, yes they are digitally based but you have a physical component so something like um there's a digital baseball, for example, and then, of course, people might uh, play Just Dance at home, these kind of games where there's definitely more needed than uh, good hand-eye coordination and hand movement. Sure, and I, I sure hope that um, Aloha Stadium in uh, Hawaii, uh, that we end up having an eSports uh, uh, venue in there. I know that they're talking about it. Um, so, um, Simon, what do you think the future of esports infrastructure projects um, will look like? Um, I mean, Marcel has already teasered it a little bit. Uh, I definitely think that especially the, the Middle East will play a big part. So the way I see it um, in terms of infrastructure projects, um, historically, um, Europe has mostly been more on demand, I would say. So, um, for example, people see a lot of demand for an esports stadium. Uh, so they will build an esports stadium, or as Marcel has said, uh, rent or buy a building that can house an esports stadium. Um, Americans usually uh, take money in their hands to do a big project when they can, and when they um, they are a little bit more. Uh, I wouldn't say aggressive, but a little bit more experimental. Um, the the Asian region, this definitely uh, has a lot more uh, publicity for esports. They have uh, more demand. Esports is kind of uh, part of their being in in some countries, at least. Like for example, um, I've been to Korea, and I will also um, relocate uh, to Korea as well uh, later this year. And Korea has uh, a ton of these so-called PC banks, um, which are basically like, uh, I wouldn't call them venues, but it's like, um, it's almost like cool office spaces where you can play video games and uh, you can order food to your table. So everything is, is focused around video games. You don't even have to get up to get food, for example. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and uh, finally, of course, the, the Middle East. Um, I've mentioned tourism before, and I think tourism will be a big, big, big driver for a lot of these projects. And the Middle East has historically been uh, very good at not waiting for the demand of tourists uh, to have these, these big venues, these big infrastructure projects, uh, these, these hotels. But they've actually... Um, taken the money into their hands and built these big, very ambitious, very cool projects and uh, created their own demand by doing that. And I think uh, definitely the other regions uh, need to be on the lookout to what the Middle Eastern guys are planning. Oh, that's uh, terrific. So Marcel, how can Wolfpack management help in infrastructure projects? Yeah, so we, we divide it up into three pieces. The first one, of course, is the very early stage things, right? You would start with something like a feasibility study. Does it make sense? What exactly are we looking for? Is it uh, built or is it um, actually just moving in somewhere? What exactly do, do we need? Is it, uh, is it a sim racing part or do we want something for streamers in there? Do we want to house professional teams? So the whole planning phase and feasibility, is it a financially viable um, endeavor or not? And tied to that, definitely you would also have a business plan that really ties not only the venue, but everything around esports and gaming as an activity into that plan. And from there, of course, you would um, then look certainly for investors and uh, finalize the interior and uh, the electronics into a certain place to, to then make it ready for the actual operational part. So that's the first part. Uh, for the second one, it's really about the monetization. Of course, after you build it, hopefully a little bit earlier, but certainly when it's operational, you need to start uh, thinking about how to make it sustainably viable as a financial endeavor. 
and uh, also know how to utilize the area, learn across. While you're using it, of course, you need to learn uh, what people are after, who is coming in, and uh, how you could further develop it while it's uh, operational. So what we can do there is um, search for sponsors and partners for an operational um, infrastructure piece or venue, and then look at the uh, marketing and the ongoing data so you can really improve what's happening in there. And then uh, one important part in that is also to uh, look at the use and utilization. Some of the areas might be in high demand, some in lower demand. And then you have to figure out, okay, how can we maximize the utilization? If you have that under control, then actually it's very easy to forecast what the kind of returns uh, are possible in, in this kind of venue. I mean, there can always uh, happen something like COVID or other uh, constraints, but uh, in, in a normal run mode, you have certainly more insurance and in your income compared to some other esports projects. Uh, if you if you get the utilization piece right, and then uh, the third piece is actually not so much on the brick and mortar stuff, so not on the venue as a as a physical um, monument. It's it's more about what is added to it uh, to come full circle. So it's about the social structure, it's about talent development, and it's about the technology that you can use in such a venue. So for example, um, you would need to set up something for health and performance. I think that's super important because a lot of the things cannot be taught or really uh, understood if you just do it remotely. So having a good health and performance program at an on-site location, especially when it has regional pull and significance, I think that's super important. The second thing uh, almost tying into it is that you actually want to have a talent program and training program for the people that come there, be it for uh, people who do it for a hobby, even they want to improve, but of course for the ones that really can make it to the top. And that's not only pro players, that's streamers as well, or people behind the scenes. So it can be producers, can be shoutcasters. Um, a lot of times we only think about the pro players, but actually if you make it more broad, it has a much, much bigger societal value in terms of education and job prospects and careers. So that's why it's important to include these things. I mean, you could go as wild as doing an incubator for independent game developers. All of this is possible if you do it correctly and have the right partners on your side. Okay, well, you know, it's um, you've provided so much good information. And I know that with your expertise on esports, uh, you're the ones to go to. So, Simon, how can people find us? <laughs> <you? laughs> uh, people can find us fairly easily either on LinkedIn, Simon Stotz and Marcel Seema, um, or you can find us uh, via our homepage, wolfpack.management. Terrific. All right. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, and thank you to uh, our viewers. Uh, make sure you tune thank in. Thank you so next. much. My guest next week will be streamer and caster Robert Rose. See you then. Thank you for having us. Bye, everyone.